Clara, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it, I know we've been talking about San Francisco being back, but it feels like it today. We're at Moscone. You, this is like a true Salesforce event. You've got the mascots. You've got so many people here. How's it going so far? It's incredible. I, I love the energy. It's great for our customers and for our teams. They've been working so hard over the last year to build a lot of these innovations that we're shipping today. So tell me about them. What is sort of the main takeaway without getting like too much in the weeds? Obviously, Salesforce place is to serve enterprise businesses in this space. What are you announcing today in terms of AI tools? So, of course, everyone knows that about consumer chatbots like ChatGPT. What we're announcing today is our Einstein Copilot, which is a business AI chatbot that knows everything about a company's employees and their customers. And so it sits within an organization and uses their data, is that right? And is closed per se, open source, but closed within. It keeps their data safe. That's right, it's completely trusted, it's completely secure within the confines of that company's data and business processes. And based on the employee who's logging in, it knows what, what data that employee has access to view and what business processes they can run. Why is it important for businesses to keep the data within their corporation? When you think about where AI goes wrong, it's really, it comes down to bad data, data leakages, data security, data privacy, hallucination issues, which, are, which come from not having enough data. Can you still have that though? How do you safeguard against that even within an organization? Because you can have huge organizations that are so large. How do you protect against, as you called it, bad, what is bad data too? Bad data is missing data or conflicting data or data that's just not correct. And so that's the number one question that I get from customers, whether they're startups or Fortune 500 CEOs, is about data. And the reason we're, we're able to safeguard it is because of our Einstein trust layer. We've engineered trust into the product, so everything from data privacy, data security, data residency, citations, data masking for anything confidential or personally identifiable, zero retention prompts, I could go on and on. We've built that in so that our customers don't have to worry. Got it, so give me some examples of how enterprises are using the Einstein chatbot. Oh, it's, it's all across the board because it's one conversation assistant across all Salesforce applications, including Slack, including Tableau, including MuleSoft. So you have customer service teams going in and trying to understand what's going on with a customer support issue and asking Einstein Copilot, help me respond to this customer. Help me draft an email so that I can really focus on getting back to the customer quickly and then focus on deepening the relationship, solving higher order problems. You have sales teams going in before they, they meet with the customer and asking Einstein Copilot, summarize everything that's happening at this account for me. And Einstein Copilot will look across all the marketing engagement, all the previous sales interactions, any open support issues, and arm that sales rep to walk in that meeting informed. So here, you've obviously got a lot of customers, a lot of enterprises, the trailblazers. Today, what are some of the most common questions you're being asked by customers? Well, this event is really special for us because this is our developer event. And we have thousands of people here in San Francisco, but millions more watching online because they want to build on the Salesforce platform. And what ISV partners and customers have always loved about Salesforce is how easy it is to build with no code. And so today we're also launching our Einstein One Studio, which is a set of low-code tools to build AI applications. So we've got a hackathon, we have a bunch of workshops, and just tremendous energy from this developer community. Something we've been tracking this year, um, the layoffs have continued past, you know, if you thought of last year was the year of efficiency, and it feels like this year is the year of AI efficiency layoffs. And sort of what you're talking about is, it sounds to me like it's simplifying the process and making um, these tools a lot more efficient. What does that look like at the end of the year or a few years on? Are companies able to be more efficient? Are they able to use smaller workforces to do these things? I do think we're in the midst of a massive technology disruption, which is affecting jobs. And we saw this in the 90s with the internet, where every single person had to write a new job description to make use of tools like email and Google search. Um, that's why we're really focused on upskilling and reskilling, you know, starting with our own employees and our customers, but really across the board. Um, we have a free online learning platform called Trailhead, and over a million AI badges and certifications have been earned by members of the public since last summer when we launched this. So that's sort of Salesforce's tools to help other, help your customers up scale their skills and resources. That's right, our customers, yeah. our partners, our own employees. Yeah. Um, we were at a dinner a few weeks ago, and I love this example you gave because it was so concrete of how Gucci is using generative AI tools to 
upskill their own workers. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So we met with Gucci in the midst of the pandemic. I remember because it was the first in-person meeting we'd had after everyone had gotten vaccinated. And um, they had this issue that many contact centers have, which is they weren't able to hire enough people to staff their client service team. And so they wondered how AI could help them. And at the time, our, our chief scientist, Silvio, Silvio Savarese, he showed our own large language models, which we've been developing since 2018, and the customer was blown away. And they, were, they decided they wanted to sign up to be a prototype customer with us. And this was a year before ChatGPT was released. So fast forward, a year later, their service teams are now using our service GPT and our Einstein co-pilot to automate manual tasks like data, data entry and data lookup. And, but it's not just reducing the average resolution time of these support tickets. What we're seeing is amazing. We're seeing these service advisors actually start to broaden their role and to become sellers and become brand storytellers because at every moment in the customer interaction, they're getting assisted and augmented by AI. So creating almost like a new generation of salespeople that use chat GPT or generative AI, excuse me. Yeah, a secure version of chat yes. GPT. And it's just amazing. Just meeting these service reps, they feel so empowered because now they're doing the best work of their careers. Right. And they feel like they can, they can be more ambitious and do more because of AI. Right, they've grown. Um, so we talk a lot about chatbots in enterprise. That feels like the first kind of use case, whether that's internal or an outward facing one, like your example with Gucci that interacts with their own customers. The promise of generative AI though, is supposed to be you know, the biggest shift since the internet, since mobile area, wh whatever you want to call it. What are some applications beyond a chatbot? How is this going to change business as we know it? Well, the chatbot or Einstein Copilot, it's an important first step because it allows every employee to ask questions and really get quick answers, but also start to orchestrate tasks and actions. So any type of business logic that a customer has built into Salesforce, and many have built many of them over the years, now the co-pilot can, can take action. So for example, if a salesperson wants to issue an invoice to a customer, in the past, they might have had to make that request to the finance department. The finance department would go into an ERP system like NetSuite, issue the invoice, send it to the customer, then let the customer, let the, the salesperson know. Now AI can kind of orchestrate a lot of those steps right. and free up, again, both the finance person and the salesperson from those manual steps. So if we play this out further, yeah. there's just a lot more that, that can happen because the AI can be proactive. And if you look at what we're doing with our Tableau Pulse product, it's an AI that you know, unprompted understands the person's business, mm -hmm. understands the leader's business, what KPIs matter, and proactively surfaces insights that that person may not have thought to ask. Right. Let's talk a little more broadly about what's been going on in the generative AI space. It's moving so quickly. Feels like recently, every week, we have sort of like a mix up or something that was unintended. Actually, well, we could say from the beginning of when ChatGPT came on the scene, there's been advances in opportunity, but there's also been um, unintended consequences. Um, we've talked a lot about Gemini's launch um, and its image generator, which was suspended. And today there was an article um, from CNBC talking about Microsoft's Copilot, how it was creating these images that were extremely inappropriate on very simple prompts. What does that tell you about where we're at right now? Well, I think we're very much in the early innings of AI. And what we're seeing, and especially in the consumer internet, it goes to show that these consumer chatbots are trained on the corpus of data on the internet. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. There's toxic data, there's incorrect data, there's copyrighted materials. And so that's why it's so important for companies to use an enterprise grade version that's rooted in trust and really why we've built everything around our Einstein trust layer. Copilots for enterprise though. Well, I think that's the challenge, right? Is, is that even though they're using models that are, that are trained on consumer internet data, for the enterprise, and so we need those extra layers of security and precaution. How do you guys look at that? I mean, does it worry you when you read an article like this about what's happened with Microsoft Copilot? And people are searching for these things, right? They're trying to prompt, in some cases, although there was a few examples where it was very, very simple, and it came up with some really disturbing images. Does that worry you about your own modeling and your own chatbots? I'd say it motivates us. It motivates us to keep red teaming and challenging the, the strength of our Einstein trust layer. We go beyond the technology though too. We, we've invested a lot in developing an acceptable use policy around AI. For example, we don't allow facial recognition AI to be used across Salesforce products. And we also require any chatbot that's AI powered to self-identify as an AI so that people know they're not dealing with a human. 
And then we also have open sourced a set of responsible AI principles that it's really important for the whole community to be a part of because it's a moving target and constantly evolving. So do you see your product as competing with Microsoft's Copilot and a story like today, does that give you kind of an edge, proof to go to your customers and say, look, we train our model on a very specific set of your own data versus a Copilot that is trained on ChatGPT? Look, Microsoft, first of all, has a lot of different co-pilots, and so primarily, when people talk about Microsoft Copilot, they're talking about using it to create PowerPoint slides and Excel and, and, and Outlook. And for us, we're in a very different business. We are building the co-pilot for CRM that's grounded in customer data. Right, right. Um, okay, I also, I remember at that dinner we were at too, as we were talking about sort of the whole AI, if you want to call it AI arms race, it's moving very, very quickly. We talked about the commoditization of large language models, et cetera, and the idea that when everyone is moving so quickly, and you have to take a step back and look at responsibility and ethics as Google has sort of made one of their tenets of their strategy, the idea that that could slow you down. And in the case of Google, you could argue, even though we're early, that it has slowed them down a little. They released Gemini long after, and they had a few different rebrands. What has been your view in working with like lawyers in the room, making sure that you're doing it responsibly? I remember in the room, people were saying that they didn't like the lawyers because it slowed them down. We have a very different philosophy at Salesforce. Our lawyers are in the room from the get-go. And you think about the company's number one value being trust. 25 years ago, we convinced Fortune 500 companies to move their most sacred data, their customer data, into the cloud. And in order to earn that trust, we had to create a trusted way to put data in the cloud. We're doing the same thing with AI today, and so the lawyers have helped us, they're part of the team, helping us engineer what that Einstein trust layer and what our policies look like. Right, and it doesn't seem to have slowed you guys down because you've been releasing products for a long time. I wonder, and I don't know, I wonder what you think of what's happening at a place like Google, which is trying to do it boldly and responsibly, but can't get it right. Is that, in your view, like a Google problem, or is that a problem of generative AI as it develops? I can't speak to how Google operates, but I think in general, I mean, how we enlist different stakeholders is really important. It's not like we build an AI product and then we send it over to the lawyers to review and then they sign off. No, they're part of the design process. And I think that's a really important way of working together. The generative AI space, it's very exciting, it's moving quickly, but it's also very, dramatic at the moment. <laughs> I know all of us that cover the space are looking closely at what's happening at OpenAI and its battle with Elon Musk. How closely are you looking at that? Does that affect, could that affect what you guys are trying to build in any way? I think everything that's happening in the model world, it, it speaks to the importance of having flexibility. It's too early to call who's going to win for governance reasons, for technology reasons, for research reasons. And so from the, from the get-go, we've taken an open architecture approach to models. And so customers can, can choose whatever model they want. It doesn't have to be open AI. They could choose Azure. They could choose Google. They could choose Anthropic, Cohere, Amazon. They could bring their own models that they fine-tune from right. scratch or train from scratch. And so I think that's really important because as this space evolves, I think what's going to happen is that there's not just going to be one model to rule them all. There's going to be many different models out there and giving customers choice is very important. Does that mean, do you think that in the future there's going to be like one closed model like a chat GPT? Who's going to build the architecture for the open models for what you're talking about? Is that going to be Llama? Is it going to be several? I think there's going to be, my personal view is that there's going to be a mix of different models that are each good at different tasks and that for very simple requests, question answering, you're not going to need to deploy a multi-trillion parameter model. It's just too expensive, too slow. And so we want to be in that, that role of routing the right task to the right model based on that customer's preference for cost, latency, and performance. Got it. Um, in terms of, I know you guys are building your own model as well. What are you using? We, talk, we spend a lot of time talking about NVIDIA and GPUs are still the best if you're building large language models, especially at the training and as we learn from them at the inference level as well, are you guys mostly using NVIDIA GPUs? Are you finding other chips? Are you broadening that out? You know, we're testing a variety of different hardware and our models are really focused on being small and medium sized models that are task specific and domain specific, such as to financial services, commercial banking, right. wealth management, et cetera. And so we're looking at different types of chips in the data center. We're also looking at running certain small models locally on the customer's right. computer. Right. 
Um, so you would say that you don't need GPUs necessarily for some of the AI applications you're developing? For some of them, we don't necessarily okay. need Got GPUs, it. correct. Last question, uh, we were talking before we came on camera around Apple's new MacBook launch. They called it the world's best consumer laptop for AI. And I was saying to you that a lot of these features, it says it has, we already have on our phone, um, <laughs> or we can access on the internet. Do you, what does it look like? I know you work on the enterprise side, but for the consumer even, do you think that for at least the near future, it's just going to be sort of this upsell cycle? Is there going to be a new piece of hardware for the AI era? Is it going to be our phone? Is it going to be something else like the rabbit or the humane pin? I do think there's going to be new form factors. I mean, we saw this with the internet, right? There were PCs, there were laptops before the internet, but the internet connectivity really changed what we could do, and it changed the requirements and demands of the hardware. And I think we're going to see the same thing with AI, especially for when the AI runs locally on the device. Do so you think it's possible that it may not be the smartphone, may not be the piece of AI hardware? Very possible. Older. Interesting. Yes. What do you think it could be? You know, it's all about AI that can sense yeah. in a multi-sensory way. It's not just the input-output of the keyboard and, and voice. And so I think, you know, maybe there's a revival of Google Glass. Who knows? Oh, interesting. Um, cool. Have you played around with the Humane pen or the Rabbit? Yes. Um, oh. Our Salesforce Ventures is an investor there and just brilliant team. And very exciting to see, again, how hardware can drive a lot of this innovation just as much of, if not as, as, as more than the model itself. The feedback was interesting to the Humane pin. Do you think that that is something that is viable for a consumer? I think that just like any software company, yeah. hardware companies have to keep innovating and pivoting and testing out different ideas until they find something that sticks. Do you work with the venture capital arm of Salesforce? Yes. What's most interesting to you right now in this space? I mean, the, our Salesforce Ventures team has been prolific. We've invested in, yeah. in all these companies, Runway, Mistral, Hugging Face, Anthropic. And so I, everything is interesting because everything is changing all at once. How much are you looking to hardware? Uh, we've looked at a couple of hardware companies. I don't believe we, we've announced any investments in hardware. Okay, got it. Claire, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate thank it. you.